Well, since you guys have already been through this, I want you to tell me here. Is what would be an example of an SAE rating? A, S, M. Uh, B, A, C, E, A. Or C, ILSAC. Or D, 5W20. Which would it be? Which of those? I'm guessing D. Huh? You're guessing the D. That would be Delta Dog. All right. You got that one, right? All right. What would be an example of an API rating? Well, let me ask you this. What's API? American Petroleum Institute. Very good answer. Very good answer. Give that man a gold star. Okay, so what would be an example of an a API rating? SM, ACEA, ILSAC, or 5W20? SM. Now, if you look on your uh, uh, top of your oil can, you're going to see uh, little, little two-letter things. Now, what does the S in SM mean? If you've got SM on top of one oil can and you've got CF on the other, what does this mean? What does this mean to you? What does this mean to you? Like that's party, that's your little API rating. What does it mean? You're going to see C, uh, C on CF on some. You're going to be C, C, C on some. But the first letter of this is the most, is what I'm focusing on right here. The S or the C, like on your oil can. Got any idea what it stands for? Most people don't have a clue. Small. Huh? Small. No. This means spark fired, and this means compression fired. If it's a sea oil, it's for diesels. Like if you look at Shell Rotella, yeah. the SM rating on it's going to be CF4 or something like that. So what I'm getting at is if you, when you look at that, you can use the diesel oils on a gas burner, but you better not go the other way. That's a general rule. See what I'm saying? Because the spark fire walls aren't made to handle what goes on in a diesel. So this, uh, particularly your newer, you know, emission friendly diesels. Uh, okay, and this is what I asked you a few minutes ago. What does the W after a rating in 5W20 sig uh, signify? A, the oil was tested in Wyoming. B, the oil was tested for winter weather temperatures at zero degrees Fahrenheit. C, the oil was tested for warm weather conditions. Or D, the oil was tested for vehicles that have W in their name. Winter, yeah, that's a B. Yeah. All right, so which of the following is considered a common multi-viscosity engine oil? 530. Yeah, this is going to be uh, 5W30. So the rest of them are, you know, but uh, what is 75W140? What is that? That's like rear, that's like rear end grease, like what goes in your rear end, right? Like differential oil. Um, let's go to number five. Lubrication does what to friction? Reduces, enhances, maximizes, or increases? Reduces. Ah, that's not a hard question there. What's the term used to describe the process when gas escapes past the piston rings and into the crankcase? Inefficiency, friction, cooling, or what? Blow by what? Either A or D. Yeah, it's going to be blow by. And why does, what does blow by do? Uh, how do we handle blow by? No, no, no. There's a, there's a different. There, the blow by's got the blow by happens even on brand new cars. You're gonna have some blow by even on a brand new engine. This is right off. You can go to J.M. Jackson up there and you can crank up a brand new Cadillac and it's gonna have blow by. So that's just part of the deal. When you got metal on metal sealing and you got little uh, okay. gap in the piston ring, some of that is gonna get by. I'm gonna say burnt rings or something. No, no. What do you, I mean? What do, we, what do we do to handle it? Like we're building an engine and it's a foregone conclusion we're going to have blow-by. That's just all there is to it. So how do we handle the blow-by? What system is on that car to handle the blow-by? We've got systems on the car. <coughs> we've got a, all right, we've got a, let's draw a V engine here as seen from the front, right? And let's just say that we've got an intake here. And in this intake, you know, we got to have air coming into the intake somewhere. And of course we got our crankcase down here. And we got our spinning crankshaft, and we got our camshaft up here, and it's operating the valve or whatever. This is a real simplified thing, okay? And let's say just to real make it really, really simple. Let's make it. Let's put an air cleaner up there. All right, we've got a hose coming off of one valve cover, pretty big hose, 
one of the air cleaner. If you're thinking about the ones with the old carburetor, they have a filter in here. A little sort of a screen filter. You see those little ones where you take the top off you a lot of times that circle have oil in it, you know. Yeah. You see that? Okay, uh, on the other valve cover, we've got a little valve that's drawing vacuum, usually through a three-eighths, usually through a three-eighths vacuum hose. This is pure manifold vacuum all the time. There's a little spring and a plunger in this thing. Now what is this thing over here? PCB valve. What does PCB stand for? Positive crankcase ventilation. It's pulling. It's actually no. You're thinking about you know polyvinyl PVC. chloride. That's PVC, not PCV. That's two different acronyms. Okay. Although an acronym has to spell a word, so you can't really say that's an acronym, right? But PCV and PVC are two different deals. So uh, obviously, duh. so we're pulling air out of the crankcase all the time. As this blow-by goes in here, we're constantly keeping air flowing through the crankcase. Well, this PCV system has got to get air from somewhere, so it gets filtered air from here. And it's constantly circulating through the crankcase. What happens if this clogs up and that clogs up? Pressure builds in the crankcase and it blows all the seals. So somebody comes into the shop and they've got an engine that's leaking oil all over the place. And I was working at a Ford place and Coca-Cola people started bringing their vehicles to us. They brought a little 4.3 in an Astro van over there. It's just leaking oil everywhere. Valve covers, front and rear, everything. You know, oil pan. Every, every, every gasket that's been leaking on that engine was leaking oil. And the guy down on the other end of the shop, the line mechanic, he resealed it. And uh, they threw it to me to, you know, check the ignition system and all that kind of stuff because we were trying to get caught up on a lot of maintenance that was behind all those trucks. And the PCV system wasn't working at all. If you pull this line loose from the breather with the engine running and you put your thumb over it, you ought to feel a little vacuum there. If everything like it ought to be. Now, if you pull that line loose and you put your hand over it for just a second, now, this is with the PCV system in place, engine idling. You put your thumb over it and it starts to build pressure and it goes whenever you move your hand, uh, then this is clogged up and everything's going this way. See, that's why they got that circling back into the breeder because they don't want any of that stuff getting out here. They want it to be processed, see. All right, now, on the vehicles like that, uh, well, like that over there, you see that hose sticking up that's coming off the oil neck on that one? Yeah. It goes to the uh, air inlet tube that goes from the breather over to the uh, throttle body. And the reason it's in there is because that air is already filtered. See, it doesn't have to have a little crankcase filter. And even if the PCV system gets clogged up and fails, this... Uh, oil steam going in there, you know, will get carried on into the engine and it's more likely to get processed without causing too many problems. It usually clog, clogs up and cakes up around the throttle plate and starts causing, uh, you know, idle problems. Uh, but you're going to have some of that anyway. When you shut off an engine, you're going to have some steam, oil steam, you know, trying to evaporate up through here and it's going to settle in there. So you have to like that. Anyway, that's what I was talking about there. So what's the term used to describe the process when ga gas escapes past the piston range and the crankcase is blow by? That's a D. What type of oil results in low levels of impurities, increases lubricating abilities, reduces sludge from forming, and protects at extremely high temperatures? Synthetic oil does that. You know. uh, well my my uh, F-150 uses synthetic blend motorcraft, seven quarts of it. Those oil changes aren't cheap. There's a Chrysler Crossfire over here that this lady, the biology instructor, has, and uh, it uses uh, nine quarts of synthetic blend oil. And when you're changing oil on a vehicle, if you look under there and it says it takes synthetic blend oil, you better pour synthetic blend oil in it. You know, don't say be, don't pour your don't pour this any other kind of oil and say be I, you know, because there's too much at stake there. And so what you're going to need to do, she was uh, that engine. I don't know why, but that engine went out in that car uh, a while back, probably a year ago. And uh, holds the car can't be too old. Oh five, I think. Hmm. But uh, I don't know why the engine went out. I have no clue what happened to it, but. <laughs> the car was too new for her to get rid of, so she went over to the dealer over here. And I think they wanted, uh, I can't remember, it seemed like it was a ridiculous amount, $13,000 or something, put an engine in that car. And so I put her in, in uh, charge in touch with LKQ down there, and she got one for 1700 bucks, and they brought it up here and dropped it off, and they popped it in there for her. <laughs> so that worked really smooth. Um, but um, anyway, uh, Technician A says, ILSAC develops and identifies standards for gasoline fuel engine oils. Technician B says API rates the engine oil service on many engine oils. Uh, who is correct about that? Who 
What is ILSAC? Do you see ILSAC in there anywhere? Somebody flip in your book and tell me what ILSAC means. International Lubricant Standardization. Yeah. International Lubricant Standardization Approval Committee. Now, who can remember that, right? Um, what is, uh, what's this stand for? Let's, let's go here. Let's say, stipulates the tools, A, N, S, I. You heard of that before? I've seen it in a lot. American National Standards Institute. Do you remember what those things stand for? Okay, what about S, A, E? Synthetic. Society of American Engineers. <laughs> you see? If you, uh, you know in your nuts and bolts, you got your fine thread and your coarse thread? SAE is what we always used to call the, uh, the fine threaded bolts. And USS, US Standard, was what we call the coarse threaded bolts in the English sizes. Uh, here's another little trivia. If I was working on a Perkins diesel engine on a forklift that was built in England, and I worked on those for several years, five years or so when I worked in Texas at that offshore services company. That's what I was doing, working on forklifts and cars and trucks and pipe loaders and all that. Okay. If I was going to my toolbox, would I go to the metric side or the imperial side? In other words, would I get a 9 16 or would I get a 14 millimeter if I was working on a Perkins diesel engine from England? I was 14 millimeter. 9 16ths. 9 16 Is there a retard in the very near tank back? No. Because that's where we got ours. The reason we have inches and feet is because we came from there. <laughs> our our well, standards of measure. Well, I come, we don't drive on the wrong side of the road. Yeah. yeah. They actually drive on the wrong side of the road because in those days, olden days, the, you had to have your sword hand ready for anybody you might be meeting. <laughs> so the horses, you know, we had a totally different. They came up through that time when if you were meeting somebody on the road, you better have your your well, weapon handy. Yeah, exactly. Most people, most people weren't though. You know what I'm saying? And uh, so, and yeah, that puts you at a different advantage. Backwards down that road. Yeah, but uh, even in Australia, which you know, here they drive on, they talk the Lamy lingo and drive on the wrong side of the road. You know, basically. But uh, here, uh, the it made more sense to drive on the right side of the road. I don't know where it came from, but I know that they decided not to go with driving on the left side of the road like we do in England. But the speedometer only the, the wheels on the other side of the car do over there. Yeah. You know, unless you're a letter carrier over here, you're gonna have a wheel on the you know, left side. You're gonna be left hand drive. Um, but anyway, that was a little thing. Oh, let me ask you this, you know why the railroad tracks or the distance from one railroad track to the other, if you measured it, is exactly the same as it was in England. And the reason the railroad tracks in England were exactly that far apart was because the ox carts were built on that standard. And the reason the ox carts were built on that standard was because all of the Roman carts that used to travel were built on that standard. And the ruts in the road were such that you better build it to fit the ruts that were there or you weren't going to go on no road over there without trouble. Mm -hmm. So you built it to fit the ruts that were there. And that was a Roman thing that went all the way back to you know, a couple of thousand years. Mm -hmm. And our railroad tracks are the same distance apart that Roman ox carts <laughs> were. Unless you're talking about these bullet trains and stuff and they have a different standard for the rails. Uh, that's a silly little bunch of trivia. So what's that national eight is? Huh? So what's the national eight is? The number eight is actually going to be a uh, seat. Both those guys are right. If you think about it, um, what does that say? The International Lubrication Standardization Approval Committee? Is that what you said that stands for? It'll sack. Did you read that? He's got to text somebody and find the answer again. No, I read it. I read it. It's the International Lubricant Standardization and Approval Committee. The International Lubricant Standardization and Approval Committee. Are you going to be able to remember that if you see it on a test without a, with your book closed? I doubt. <laughs> see, you can memorize that. Same, same with me, right? You know, you need to, the more, the more little piece of information you wire in there, the better you're going to be. Technician A says 5W30 would be better to use than 20W50 in most vehicles in cold weather conditions. Technician B says 20W50 flows better than 5W30 in cold weather. Who is correct about that? B. Yeah, it's going to be A. Basically, 5W30 is going to be better in cold weather conditions because 20W50 is going to be a thicker oil. And why do we have a problem with thick oil in cold weather? Because it gets thicker or stays thick. 
well, when the engine warms up, it gets thin. But whenever you're trying, when I to start it first thing in the morning, and it's trying to churn that crankcase through all that molasses thick oil, you have trouble with that. It's a lot easier for it to spin that crank, even on cold days. Now, let me ask you this. This, this may throw you. I actually uh, picked this up at a, uh, I went to El Paso, Texas to teach a, uh, some classes to on Power Stroke Diesel and uh, Duramax back in, gosh, two or three, four years ago. And uh, I was teaching the Border Patrol mechanics. There was about 25 of those guys up there. But I, I sat in on a class that was taught by a guy named Kevin McCartney. And uh, he was talking about motor oil. That was a class that he was, it was a PowerPoint presentation, a class he was teaching to some local mechanics from shops about motor oil. And he said that um, uh, zero W oils, have you seen those on the really new cars? I mean, the, the actually oil is zero W20 or zero W whatever. Uh, that oil is not thinner than five W oil, it's thicker. For some strange reason, they've gone off in a different direction with that. So just keep that in mind. You're not you're not seeing a thinner oil when you see zero W than you are when you see five W. Now that's just that totally throws everything out the window that you believe. You know, but, yeah, it just messes up. But the thing about it is, here's the long and the short of it is, if if the car is, uh, I'm gonna say newer than probably a 2003 model, or even if it's a if it's a hybrid vehicle, uh, you better use exactly the oil they tell you to use. And on hybrid vehicles, you use exactly the tires you're supposed to run on that sucker. Don't just slam any set of tires on it. You better get exactly the kind of tires you're supposed to put on there. Because what happens is these people have got this fuel economy uh, display. And if you put some, any other kind of tire on there than the one, uh, you know, they're going to say, well, I was getting 48 miles to the gallon, and now I'm only getting 36. So what did you do to my car? Yeah. See what I'm saying? I mean, they're going to see a ton of difference in their gas mileage, and they are really meticulous drivers about that. So you, that's why you got to put exact. Also, the stuff that goes on in the engine on a hybrid, there's a lot of little uh, thing. You know, where the oil's got to go through real tiny passages on the, on the gasoline engine that a hybrid has in it. Uh, Ford pickup trucks. If you put the wrong kind of oil in like a 2005 or 2006 Ford pickup truck, you're going to have issues. You need to put the oil that it calls for, the exact oil it calls for, the weight and everything. But it's pour any kind of oil you got on the shelf over there, and you're going to have trouble. Because what happens is it comes back and you're going to shove them out the door and say, we didn't do anything except change your oil, get out of our face and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, then they go down to the dealership and they, all they do is change your oil and it fixes it and now it's back on you. See, see where I'm going with that? I mean, you don't want to have any oil. That's why I say like we own a Chrysler Crossfire. If it says under the hood it takes nine and quarters of synthetic blend oil, even if the person bought it at the, at the auction barn and they're crying in their soup because they don't want to pay $100 for an oil change, you, you know, you're going to have to put what's in there, what's supposed to go in there. That's just all there is to it. Um, Technician A says uh, SM oils can replace SL oils. Technician B says S and SM oils for spark ignition engines. Who's correct? Technician B says at the S and SM stands for spark ignition engines. Technician B is right about that. Um, you got to really watch, like I say, <coughs> you know, pay attention to which oil it is that it calls for. And uh, now I will tell you this though, uh, if you look on your uh, all cap, you know, typically you just say, it'll just say 5W20 or whatever, right? You know what I'm saying? That's going to give you an idea about that. Uh, the good thing about it is if you call the parts house, like if it's Advanced or O'Reilly's or somewhere like that, then you can say, if they can look in their book and it'll tell you what all is supposed to go in that particular car because they got, you know, pretty exhaustive stuff over there. I will tell you what they don't do right is um, they don't always tell you how many quarts it takes. They don't know that sometimes they're booked wrong. Just about every time I, if I don't tell the guy at the parks house that these Crown Victorias that we have around here take six quarts of oil. Every single one of them takes six quarts of oil. He'll send five every single time. But you know what he does? If I call him up, yeah, he'll give me another quart. I mean, if I just say, hey, you didn't give me enough oil, he sends me a free quart. You know, I mean, he's good about doing that. Either the industrial guy is. I mean, the, I would call two quarts. Yep. Now well, some of those, uh, some of these engines that you would expect to use a lot more oil use like four and a half. Okay, let me ask you this about. Uh, let's say that uh, your Chevrolet pickup truck, uh, you know, takes what your, your 350 in your Chevy took three to five quarts in it. Yeah. So if it goes down to if it gets a quart low on oil, how much of a problem is that? Yeah. Well, I mean, if it, what if it's uh, you know this the teeny bit low? It's not gonna matter that much. 
but uh, what kind of a problem is it going to cause? Uh, the oil, here's the thing that I got from vehicle manufacturers. Um, it, you know, you can get easily get, even in rough usage, 3,000 miles out of quart of oil. If it's, I mean, out of the oil change, if it's full. If it drops down one quart low, let's <laughs> say it was calling for five and you got four, that oil breaks down in 1,500 miles. Yeah. Now, there was a guy years ago that I knew a long time ago, a uh, black guy, uh, had worked for the Parks and Recreation Department. He was a sophisticated, you know, well-schooled kind of a, and he had made pretty good money down there at the Parks and Recreation Department in Los Angeles, and he moved back to Port Arthur because he's, you know, government cutbacks got his job and all that kind of stuff. But he drove a GMC pickup truck. It was a 74 model, I think, that he had bought with it. When it only had like 2,000 miles on it, he bought it used. And uh, he was talking, he didn't know anything about cars. I mean, nothing. He was just over in the shop helping us because it was a job, you know, he changed all stuff. And I said, uh, he said, um, my timing chain broke in my truck the other day and it bent all the valves. And we had to pull the heads off, cost $400 to fix it, you know. That was in like 1979. Yeah, 79 is when it was. I mean, it was a long time ago. And this was like a 74 model truck. And um, But he had driven it a lot. He had come back and forth to Port Arthur a lot because his family lived there and he was you know, living in Los Angeles. And uh, of course, he had a wife and kids and all that kind of thing. His name was Edmund Harrison. And um, he said, uh, I started talking to him about that truck. I said, Time Machine broke? I never heard of that in my life. The Time Machine broke on a truck? Really? He said, Yeah, that's what they told me. He said, Time Machine broke, been all around. And I said, um, so I started talking to him a little more about it, and I said, uh, have you ever had to do anything else to the truck? And he was, no, I've just been driving it. I don't know. And I said, uh, well, how many miles did it have on it? And he said, well, I don't really know. What do you mean you don't know? I said, well, the speedometer quit working, you know, a long time ago. I said, well, how long did I go to the speedometer quit working? He said, well, it had 385,000 on it when the speedometer quit. Really? And so I talked to him some more about it. I just kept asking him questions. He didn't. He wasn't lying about any of this. He was just. He didn't know that was a lot of miles to get on a vehicle. He had no clue. You know what I'm saying? That was. He, I was. You know, bought that truck. I guess right after he got out of high school and he got that job. So I said, um, I talked about the oil changes. You know how often he changed the oil in that truck? Every single time he changed the oil, he did it at 1,500 miles. Every time. And because he did the oil change, I bet that had a lot to do with why he got as many miles on that truck as he did. But he never even met a uh, Well, up to 385,000 he knew. See where I'm going. But um, he had to estimate after that. But the point I'm trying to make is he went 1,500 miles. He said, that's a lot of miles. I need to change all of this truck. So he'd have the oil change every 1,500 miles, just like clockwork, all the time. And, uh, and I said, well, don't you know how often most people change their oil? He goes, I don't have a clue. But I just felt like 1,500 miles was a long way to go to the same wall. I mean, he didn't, like I said, he didn't know anything. But because of that, he over-maintained it. And he got all that many extra miles because he always had crystal clear, clean oil in his crankcase. Here's something else. It's a guy that works out there. I mean, Donnie Hughes has got a shop out there, Bay Springs, over in here in Dothan. And he said there's this guy, and every time that guy brings his truck in or his car, anything he's got, anything this guy's got, he's, a, he's got a diesel pickup and all this kind of stuff. Brett, you ever change oil to diesel? And diesel? Yeah. Uh, uh, like a diesel or like no, I'm talking about like a regular diesel pickup truck. What does oil look like when you drain it out of there? Black. Just jet black. I mean, it'll stain your clothes it's so black. You know what I'm saying? It's black, 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 really. Well, he changes his oil at the normal interval this guy does. <coughs> and every time, Donnie says, every time I break the drain plug loose on his, on his pan, when he put up all this, Break it loose. He said the oil that's running out there looks like somebody just poured it in there. Hmm. And that's on his car and it's on his truck too. And he goes like 3,000 miles before he changes. And, you know, Donnie's been doing this about as long as I have. I mean, I've been here, I've been doing this 35 years. And Donnie says, How do you keep the oil in your truck so clean? That guy says, I drive it like I'm always afraid I'm going to tear it up. He said, I don't take off fast. I don't give it a lot of gas when I go. I take off gentle. You know, I mean, I'm always driving it real easy. He doesn't get a lot of blow by because he didn't punch it a lot. See what I'm saying? He lets the truck take him where he's going, but he goes very gently. Now, I'm not saying he don't drive 70 miles an hour on the interstate, but he doesn't take off fast. <coughs> that's where that stuff comes from. But anyway, that's an interesting old story, too. Well, I had a call, I had a slug, but, all right. Uh, yeah, what's it called? I don't know. It bit up, but it ain't slug. It's still 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, he actually runs at normal speeds, I think, on the highway, but he doesn't take off quick. See what I'm saying? That's the point. And that's where you get your, that's how you hear me your car glass good. Now, um, something else that you got to note is when somebody doesn't let an engine warm up to operating temperature, if they just drive it short distances every day, like mom and pop, it sludges the engine up really, really bad. Or if you got one sitting in the driveway, and you say, well, I'm going to keep this limbered up. And once a week, you crank it up and you let it run for 45 seconds or a minute, and then you switch it off. If you do that every day to a car for, you know, six months, it'll have so much sludge in it, finally it won't even run. It'll just completely get clogged up with sludge inside there. Because it's blow by, you're making water when you burn gas, right? The water gets down in there and mixes with the oil, it con and condenses, and it turns into a sort of a pasty sludge. It's just black and ugly, and it stops everything up. So, anyway, uh, so number 10 is B. Technician A says synthetic oils are generally less expensive than conventional engine oil because they use less crude oil. Now, that's nonsense. Uh, technician B says using synthetic oil, you can increase oil intervals from 3,000 to 50,000 miles. Who's correct about that? Neither one of those guys is right. Everybody knows synthetic oil costs more, and everybody knows you can't go 50,000 miles on one uh, crankcase of oil. I will tell you this, though. The Chrysler Crossfire with the nine quarts of synthetic goes 10,000 miles between oil changes. That's the Chrysler. I mean, the oil changes cost more, but you ain't got to do them as often. And um, so technician A says if the oil warning light indicates the engine has low or no oil pressure, that means oil needs changing. <laughs> technician B says if the oil warning light indicates the engine has low or no oil pressure, you will shut off your engine. Who's correct about that? Hello? Hey. Right, that's for me. Yeah, I knew it. They need to know it's mine, though. Yeah, it's, it's mine. That was one that Peggy got me through, through uh, some kind of funding or something. Okay. All right. Got a new drill press, guys. Okay, now the... Uh, let me ask you this. You, uh, what does it mean when your oil light comes on? Oh. How does the light know to come on? Yeah. <clears throat> all That's a good plan. All right, on Forbes, since 1987... They have had an oil, they got an oil pressure gauge, right? But it always reads in the middle, pretty much. Because on that oil pressure gauge, now when your oil pressure goes a certain, you know, poundage, usually seven pounds or less, the oil out will start to flicker and come on, uh, on the ones that have an oil out. But on the Ford, the oil pressure closes that switch. There's a 22 ohm resistor going to the gauge, typically, and the gauge just goes to the middle. It's not a true gauge. Now on my Jeep, it's a true gauge. In most of your Chevys, it's a true gauge. Yeah, it's we got an 87 Ford. Yeah. Her gauge is messed up anyway, so we'll, we'll put a new one in. Yeah. Well, you can take that sending unit out. The contacts are dirty in it, usually. You just put a new sending unit, it'll go boom, right up in the middle and be just black. We see that all along. But those contacts inside that switch actually get dirty and get to where they're not making the oxidize a little bit. And uh, here's how you check that. You pull the sending unit wire off. You ground it with the, with the engine off and the key switched on, and the gauge will go boom, right in the middle. That's not hard to do, is it? Pull the, sensor, pull the gauge wire off, touch it to the ground. Mm. Well, how about yeah, on my tan thing I used to have, uh, this any one? Like, every time I change the oil, then it always go back and reach your 40, you know, with the pressure. And uh, then I changed the oil, like, last month. And, uh, like, it goes down from 40. It go like in between. It go about twenty, and I'm actually asked to go up to about sixty. Mm -hmm. Don't just stay on forty like I used to. Yeah. I used to, and then I changed oil, and I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what is it doing now? Is it going low or not? I mean, when you let out the gas, it go back down to about twenty, mm -hmm. and it's full oil. I change it. It's probably it's probably reading true oil pressure. As the engine uh, ages, as the engine ages, what happens? You got slack in your bearings, right? And your bearings are under pressure. And if the bearings are, are starting to wear out, they got a little bit of slop there. And as the engine, it probably doesn't do that when it's cold, does it? When it's cold, it probably has better. It's out, it's out, it's cold. Yeah. Well, not only that, the oil's thicker. All right. So you got your, uh, you got a little bit of slop between your bearings and your crank, and the oil that's going in there when it's thin will shoot out of there. Instead of, did your computer cut off on you? Yeah. How in the world did you? Oh, you bumped the switch. That's yeah. crazy. 
That other one shot off over there too. Oh, you must hit it with your foot. Yeah, it is. Oh, okay. But uh, anyway, uh, the long and the short of it is, and here's what you do. Um, here's another little short story that I like to tell when we're talking about oil. Uh, Jeep uh, Cherokee, straight six, you know, lubrication system normal. I'm, I'm getting to where you're talking about here in a minute. This is going to answer your question. Um, this guy bought it from the sale. Uh, 33,000 miles on it, 2,000 model cream puff. This has been back, this back in like 2003. And so he drove it for six, seven, eight thousand miles, him and his wife. And when they took it by to have the oil changed on it at the tire store over there, or I know the guy that owns the tire store Enterprise, they changed the oil like they would on the other vehicle. And then when they cranked it up, it didn't have any oil pressure. So, you know, somebody poured motor honey in it and stuff so it have oil pressure. And so they took it to the Chrysler place and they said, oh, I don't know, maybe probably it's an oil pump or something. I don't know what's wrong with that. So anyway, they took it back over to the tire store and the guy at the tire store was asking me about it. And his name was Jeff. And I called Jeff. I said, Jeff, pull the oil pan off of that thing. Pull the oil pump off of it. Get an air blower, like the rubber tip oh, blower. Green. No, get an air blower. Pull the oil pump off and lay it over on the bench. You know the hole where the oil pump shoves the oil up in there? Shove that rubber tip blower up in there and shoot air pressure up in there. Just as hard as you can. And watch to see where that oil pressure is leaving. Because now you can see all up in the engine, you can you know the, the cam bearings are up there, the crank, you know, the, all that. And he would he didn't do that. For some strange reason he didn't attach a lot of significance to what I was telling him. He just threw an oil pump on it. And he didn't, and he threw the old oil pump in the trash. I mean it's just Stupid! I wanted the old oil pump so I could look at it and all, but anyway, he didn't get it. So anyway, he put it back together. Well, the oil pressure was better. It was like seemed normal when it was cold, but when it warmed up, it would drop way down. You know, idling, it would go so low that it'd scare you to death. And so he took it to a shop, another shop over there at Enterprise, and they told him he needed a five thousand dollar engine. And he said, well, I ain't got the money for a $5,000 engine. I mean, he paid $10,000 for the Jeep, you know. Beautiful Jeep. I mean, it's like my yellow one, except it was red. And so it was sitting in the garage. He was a soldier, you know, helicopter pilot. And the guy that owned the shop called me and says, could you, you know, since he got a government job, he qualifies to have worked at school. And I said, yeah, but bring it over here. We'll look at it. We'll do an engine repair it anyway. So we pulled it up, dropped the oil pan. And I told him, I said, pour some STP oil treatment in there, motor honey, and get it over here, you know, so you don't hurt it on the way. So they brought it over here and we drained everything out of it, pulled the oil pan off, shot it up there. It's just hissing up a storm around the cam bearing. She's losing all of it. That oil is thin as gasoline when it's hot anyway. And if it doesn't have good tight bearings, that oil pressure is going to depart in the oil gallery. It can't build up any pressure because it's just squirting oil where your cam bearing is probably wearing out. That's usually what it is. So the cam bearings are high up in there. They're on the upper end of the oil gallery, right? And so they're the first things that are going to starve. That's why you hear your, you know, I, you know how when you're low on oil, you hear your lifters clackety, 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 clack. That's some of the last stuff that gets oil. You see, the crankshaft is the, you know, the hub where everything, where all the work, hard work's being done. Yeah. Well, their oil pump had failed, and it began to starve for oil, and they drove it just enough to where they wiped out the cam bearings. And even when he put a re replacement oil pump on there, the cam bearings were already fouled up. So we. Pull the engine out. We actually mic uh, uh, plastic gauge, you know, that little waxy string you put on there to see how much clearance you got. We plastic gauge the crank and, uh, you know, the main and rod bearings. They were fine. It won't hurt. So we pull, uh, pull the motor out of it, pull the head off of it, pull the front off the engine, yank the camshaft out of there. And um, the cam bearings wore slam out. And so we put, but now here's this. You know, how many of you knew, even on your Chevys, in most cases, not in all cases, but in most cases, or in a lot of cases, I'm going to say, the cam bearings are not all the same size. You'll think they are, because if you've got them in your hand, you'll think, oh, this is just a bunch of cam bearings, I can put them wherever I want to. <coughs> on, on that Jeep, they're a different size as you go. And the, if you get them from Perfect Circle or whoever, they're going to have the numbers stamped sequentially so you can tell. But if you get them from the dealership, they're going to be color-coded. And I have a little piece of paper saying you put this one here, this one here, this one here, and this one here. So you can't just put those little round cam bearings in there any way you want to. You better put the right one in the right spot. It's important to know that. Well, we put cam bearings in that thing, put it back together, dropped the motor back in it, fired it up. And it had uh, like uh, 50, 60 pounds of oil pressure idling all the time. And so, you know, I think because we don't charge any labor, 
uh, and there's no guarantee on what we do, we could do that without a problem. It was like costing two hundred fifty dollars or something like that. If he'd had it in the shop, see, they'd had to guarantee a whole bunch of crap, yeah. and they'd have had to charge a whole bunch of labor. And so, in their, from their perspective, it would have been smarter just to throw an engine in it. And I understand why they price that out like that. <coughs> but the fact is, on your truck, on that three fifty you got. Now, if it was a new body style, you could take that cross member loose from under the motor and stop the wall pan off of it fairly easy. On the older trucks, it's kind of a pain to get the wall pan off, you know. On the, uh, but you get that oil pan off, boy. And you shoot that air pressure up in there and see where it is. Something else we used to do check for oil leaks at the Ford dealership over there is we would cap off the PCB system, both sides of it, with you know with these plastic plugs, and we would pull the dipstick out and we'd get a little air pressure regulator, you know, like what you even buy them for nearly nothing, and we would put 15 pounds of shop air pressure, you know, going through that regulator on the dipstick tube. If you have an oil leak, it's a splash oil leak. You'll find it this way. And see, what I'm saying is when you got that air pressure on there, you go around with your soap bottle, you spray, and you're going to see bubbles where your oil's coming out. <laughs> it's fairly simple. See, it's not complicated to do a lot of this stuff if you just think normally. You can also, let's say it's a pressure oil leak. Like, you know, on the overhead cam engine, you've got oil uh, pressure going through the head gasket to all the cam shafts, right? Okay, those son of a guns have got to have uh, pressurized oil up there. And that little O-ring around the head gasket, I've seen them doggone things leak and people think it's rear main sealed. That's why it's important to clean all that stuff off real good. We like to put some dye in there, drive it down the road, and let it start leaking again with that dye leaking out. you got to get some really good dye, though. Some of this dye barely doesn't even make the oil glow at all. Pull it back on the lift, raise it up. Shop in Tallahassee was wanting to put a rear main seal on it for $1,000. And when we checked it, it wasn't leaking from the rear main seal, it was leaking from the dead gun head gasket over where the, on the end of the head gasket close to the transmission where the oil goes through. Well, if you got a pressure leak, take shop air pressure, pull your oil sending unit out, shoot shop air pressure in there. See if you see it spraying all out somewhere. You can do that with the engine, you know, uh, cold. You don't have to have the engine hot and running and check the oil leak. I mean, if you put the air pressure in there, you know, it's better if you want to make sure that you're going to get it through, you can warm the engine up and shut it down, you know, and then shoot the air pressure in. But, I mean, you know, most of the time you got, uh, on a lot of these engines, you got one eighth or a quarter inch pipe. The, the later model, the 5.3's got screwball threads, oddball threads for your oil, you know, uh, sending unit. They're not the same as a pipe thread like you see on most of the other ones. But you can build an adapter, just go up in there and shoot your mate. I'd probably shoot 60, 70 pounds of shop air pressure up in the oil gallery which is oil gallery is what your oil pressure sending unit is tapped into. If you put too much in there, you'll blow the oil filter off the dirt thing. You don't want to go there, right? But uh, shoot that air pressure up in there and look for oil leaks like that. And, uh, but the dye is really good for looking for stuff, you know, the oil leaks too. But, uh, I got a question. Well, that one's B, by the way. The 12 is B. Yeah. I got a question. I got a